Hello, welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're going to be reading from East by Edith Patu. And as I explained last Friday, oh, and I'll put the link below if you didn't see that video, um, I'm doing a series on YA novels that are inspired by folktales. So this one is inspired by the Norwegian folktale East of the Sun, West of the Moon. And last week's book is also partly inspired by that same folktale and one other one. And at some point I'm also going to do a video reading the actual folktales that inspire some of these stories. Alright, let's jump right in. Prologue. I found the box in the attic of an old farmhouse in Norway. It was large, the size of a footlocker, and there were markings on it. Runes, I learned later. When I opened the lid, it looked like the box contained mostly papers, a jumbled mass of them, in several different languages and written in different styles of handwriting. There were diaries, maps, even ship's logs. As I dug deeper under the papers, I found more. Skeins of wool, small boots made of soft leather, sheaves of music tied with faded ribbon, long, thin pieces of wood with map-like markings on them dried up mushrooms, woven belts, even a dress the color of the moon. Then I came upon what looked to be the mouthpiece of a very old reed instrument. I held it up toward the light coming through the small attic window. As the late afternoon sun caught it, a most extraordinary thing happened. I heard the clear, high note of a flute. And it was coming from inside the trunk. Other sounds came then, whispering, muttering, swirling around inside my head. Dogs barking, sleigh bells, the cracking of ice. Voices. Hearing voices. This isn't good, I thought. Still, holding the ancient mouthpiece in the palm of my hand, I lifted the top piece of paper out of the trunk. It was a handwritten note. They want me to write it down, though I am not sure why. It seems enough that Father and Nettie wrote down their parts, especially Nettie. He was always the storyteller in the family. I am not a storyteller, not really. It takes more patience than I've got, or rather than I used to have. I guess I did learn a little bit about patience in the course of the journey, but even so, I'd much rather set the story down in cloth. Well, actually I have. Hangs on the north wall in the great room, and the whole story is there. But words are easier to understand for most people, so I will try. It isn't easy for me to walk the path back to the beginning of the story, even to know where the true beginning is. And telling a story, I suppose, is like winding a skein of spun yarn. You sometimes lose track of the beginning. All I intended to do when I began the journey was to set things right. They say losing someone you love is like losing a part of your own body, an eye or a leg, but it is far worse, especially when it is your fault. But already I'm getting ahead of myself. It all began with a pair of soft boots. Book One, East. Once on a time, there was a poor farmer with many children. Father. Eva Rose was the name of our last born child, except it was a lie. Her name should have been Neum Rose, but everyone called her Rose rather than Eva, so the lie didn't matter. At least that is what I told myself. The rose part of her name came from the symbol that lies at the center of the wind rose, which is fitting because she was lodged at the very center of my heart. I loved each of her seven brothers and sisters, but I will admit there was always something that set Rose apart from the others. And it wasn't just the way she looked. She was the hardest to know of my children, and that was because she would not stay still. Every time I held her as a babe, she would look up at me intent, smiling with her bright purple eyes. But soon, and always, those eyes would stray past my shoulder, seeking the window and what lay beyond. Rose's first gift was a small pair of soft boots made of reindeer hide. They were brought by Torsk, a neighbor, and as he fastened them on Rose's tiny feet with his large calloused hands, I saw my wife, Eugenia, frown. She tried to hide it turning her face away. Torsk did not see the frown, but looked up at us, beaming. He was a widower with grown sons, and a gift for leather work, eager to show off his handiwork and unmindful of the difficult circumstances of Eugenia's recent birthing. He had been the first to show up on our doorstep. 
Most of our neighbors were well aware of how superstitious Eugenia was. They also knew that a baby's first gift was laden with meaning. But cheerful, large-handed Torsk paid no heed to this. He just gazed down at the small, soft boots on Rose's feet and looked ready to burst with pride. The fit is good, he observed with a wide smile. I nodded and then said, with a vague thought of warning him, "'Tis Rose's first gift." His smile grew even wider. "'Ah, this is good!' Then a thought penetrated his head. "'She will be a traveler, an explorer,' he said with enthusiasm. So he did know of the first gift superstition after all. This time Eugenia did not attempt to hide the frown that creased her face, and I tensed, fearing what she might say. Instead, she reached down and straightened one of the boot ties. "'Thank you, neighbor Torsk,' she said through stiff lips. Her voice was cold, and a puzzled look passed over the big man's face. I stepped forward and, muttering something about Eugenia still being weak, ushered Torsk to the door. "'Was there something wrong with the boots?' he asked, bewildered. "'No, no,' I assured him. "'They are wonderful. Eugenia is tired, that is all. And you know, mothers, they like to keep their babes close. She's not quite ready for the notion of little Rose wandering the countryside.' nor would she ever be, though I did not say that to neighbor Torsk. That night, after we had pried Nettie from Rose's basket and gotten all the children to sleep, Eugenia said to me, Didn't widow Hotzig bring over a crock of butter for the baby? She was only returning what you loaned her, I said. No, it was for Ebba Rose, her first gift, I'm quite sure. Her voice was definite. Eugenia did like to keep her children close, but it turned out she wanted to keep Rose closest of all, and that had everything to do with the circumstances of Rose's birth. Nettie Our family wasn't always poor. My grandfather S. Bjorn Laverins had a well-respected map-making business, and my father's father was a prosperous farmer. But father had a falling out with his family when he went to Bergen to be an apprentice to the mapmaker Esbjorn. My mother, Eugenia, was Esbjorn's daughter, which is how father met her. Father and mother had eight children. Rose was the last born, and I was second to last, four years old when they brought Rose home from Askoy Forest. Some would say four is too young to remember, but I definitely have memories. Lots of them. I remember her smell, like warm milk and soft green moss. I remember the noises she'd make, gurgling like the creek we later took to calling Rosie's Creek because she fell into it so often, the clicking she made with her tongue like a wren pecking our chimney, the howls of frustration when she kept toppling over while learning to walk. Not that it took her long. She was running around on her short legs at just five months. I also remember clearly the evening mother and father came home from an afternoon of herb hunting, and instead of herbs, they were carrying a lumpy bundle that made funny noises. My older brothers and sisters had been worried about mother and father because there had been a storm and they were much later than usual returning. I told everyone not to worry, that they had gone out to bring home the baby and that's why they were so late getting home. My older sister Selma laughed. Mother is still more than a month away from her lying in time, she said. And besides, everyone knows you can't just go pluck babies out of Oskoy Forest, she added with a superior look. But it turned out I was right after all. When they finally came through the door, Mother looked very pale and sat down as soon as she could, holding the noisy thing on her lap. The others crowded round, but I hung back, waiting. When they'd all looked long enough, Father led me to Mother's side. When I gazed at the little scrunched-up face, I felt a peculiar glow of pride like I'd done something good. I knew it was Mother who brought this baby into the world, and she certainly looked worn out from doing it. But from that moment, I felt like the wild little brown-haired baby was my very own gift, and that it would be my job to watch over her. If I had known just how wild a thing she would turn out to be, I might have thought twice about taking her on. It's a funny thing. I think it was Mother and I who had the hardest time with Rose's wandering ways. But we both had different ways of living with it. Mother tried always to reel her in, to keep her close by. But for me, I knew it couldn't be done. 
So I just ached and felt sorry for myself when she'd disappear. That's the trouble with loving a wild thing. You're always left watching the door. But you also kind of get used to it. Rose. I could say that I felt guilty and ashamed about the trouble I was always getting into when I was a child, driving my mother to her wit's end on a daily basis. But the truth is, I never did feel either of those things. I don't think it's because I was selfish or unfeeling. I just couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. What was a little spilled blood or a broken bone now and then? I never set out to be disobedient. I just couldn't keep my thoughts and then my feet still. I'd see something. The azure flash of a butterfly's wing. A formation of clouds like a ship's mast and sails. A ripe yellow apple perched high in a tree and I'd be off after it without a second thought. Exploring ran in my blood. My grandfather, Esbjorn, was a map maker as well as an explorer, and my great-great-grandfather was one of the first Njordans to travel to Constantinople. The only thing that gave me the slightest twinge of sadness was Nettie, with his exasperated, sorry-for-himself look when he found me after yet another time I'd run off without telling anyone. But I saw this rabbit with a tail so white it glowed, I tried to explain, when I was old enough to put words to my feelings. Nettie would just sigh and say that Mother wanted me in the kitchen straight away. I'm sorry, Nettie, I'd say, wrapping my arms around his legs, watching the corners of his mouth for that smile I always managed to squeeze out of him. And then I'd go to the kitchen and Mother would scold me yet again. Nettie. To say that my mother was superstitious would be like saying the great blizzard of 1539 was not but a light snowfall. Every single thing a body did in our house was charged with meaning. To sweep dust out the front door was to sweep away all your good luck. To sing while baking bread was to guarantee the arrival of ill fortune. To have an itch on the left side of your body meant certain disaster. And if you sneezed on a Wednesday, you would surely receive a letter. Good news if you were facing east, and bad if facing north. Father liked to tell the story of how he first learned of Mother's birth direction superstition. When father and mother announced their engagement to her family, the first words to come out of his future mother-in-law's mouth were, But Arno, we don't even know what your birth direction is. Father said that he gaped at her, totally bewildered. Yes, Arna, we must know right away before you and Eugenia make any more plans. Oh, I'm quite certain he's a South, or a Southeast, Mother said reassuringly. But we must know for sure, said her mother. Father said he started to laugh then, thinking they were having some elaborate joke with him, but they weren't. And Father would have us all doubled over with laughter as he described the pilgrimage to my grandparents' farm to interrogate them regarding the direction my father's mother was facing when she gave birth to him. It turned out that the direction his mother was facing when father was born was southeast, which was, a, which was a good thing according to mother. What wasn't such a good thing is that this turned out to be the last time father saw his family. There had already been ill feeling between them that father had hoped to heal during the visit, but if anything the strange line of questioning from the city folk father was marrying into seemed to make matters worse, and they parted with bad blood. Father. My Eugenia's fervent belief in the birth direction superstition was unusual to say the least. I have never come across anything like it during the course of my life, but it had apparently been handed down through many generations of Eugenia's family. They believed that birth direction was of overwhelming importance, not the alignment of the stars, nor the position of the moon, nor the movement of the tides, nor even the traits handed down from parent to child. My theory was that this strange notion sprang from their preoccupation with map making. And every child born in our family, Eugenia explained to me, is given a name that begins with the first letter of their birth direction. So a north facing baby might be called Nathaniel, a southwest facing child, Sarah Wilhelmina, and so on. I myself was an east-facing baby. And what are the attributes of an east-facing baby? I asked. Well, among other things that I am tidy, a sound sleeper, and somewhat superstitious. 
Somewhat, I countered with a grin. It turned out that Eugenia went a little further with the birth direction superstition than any of her forebears. On the night after we were wed, she announced to me that she wanted to have seven children. Seven is a good number, I replied. But why seven? Is that a particularly lucky number? I said with a teasing smile. No, it's that I want one child for each point of the compass, she replied. Puzzled, I said, but that would be four or eight, perhaps. I have left out north, of course. Why not north, I asked. Surely you know about pure northern children, she responded in surprise. No, I said, refraining from reminding her that no one outside her family would even be engaged in such a conversation. Oh, they are terrible, wandering and wild and very ill-behaved. Northern people in general are that way. My own sister, surely I've told you this, married in Northbourne, against the advice of our mother, needless to say, and he took off on a sailing ship when she was pregnant with their third child and has not been heard of since. I refuse to have a child I cannot keep my eye on. I felt a sliver of worry at those words. I hope you're not going to be an overprotective mother, Eugenia. Oh no, Arna, she reassured me. It's just that Norths are particularly wild, always into trouble. But this is not the only reason I will not have a North Bairn. There is another of much more importance. And what is that? Some years ago, I went with my sister to a Schebnisoka. Those Schebnisokas were scarce in our region. I was not surprised that someone as superstitious as Eugenia had managed to find one. She was very gifted, this Chebnisoka. Why, she predicted to the day when Karen Tessel would have her first bairn. And she told my sister that she would lose her husband to the sea. Eugenia trailed off, then fell silent. I studied her face. The Chebnisoka said something about you having a north bairn? She nodded, then said in a low voice, she said that if I were to have a Northborn, that child would grow up to die a cold, horrible death, suffocating under ice and snow. She shuddered, and instinctively I drew her close to me. Because avalanches were not uncommon during the winter in our country, especially on the seven mountains that surrounded Bergen, I could see that Eugenia took this ominous prediction quite seriously. I myself considered such prophecy and superstition to be nonsense, and perhaps if I had tried to reason with Eugenia, taken a stronger stand against her many superstitions right from the beginning, I might have averted much of the ill fortune that later befell us. But I did not. I saw her ideas as harmlessly eccentric, even charming at the outset, and I indulged her. I too wanted a large family, and seven seemed as good a number as any. But even Eugenia's own mother thought that methodically planning the birth directions of each of her children was ill-advised. Before she died, she had cautioned Eugenia against it. "'Tis meddling in the affairs of God and fate, and only disaster can come of it," she had said. Eugenia herself had been born due east. Her mother went into labor unexpectedly on a boat that was traveling down the Rauma River, which was notoriously twisty. Fortunately, Eugenia's mother had had a Leiderstein, a needle with her. She carried both with her at all times during her pregnancy, and the owner of the boat brought a pail of water. While his wife labored, Esbjorn magnetized the needle and floated it in the water. So it turned out that they were able to calculate the birth direction without much difficulty. To think I might have been a north had the boat taken a sudden turn, Eugenia would mutter darkly. Eugenia began our family with Northeast, Niels Erland. Her reasoning was that she would tackle the most difficult direction first, when she was youngest and most vigorous, and the next most difficult, Nettie Wilfrid, at the end, when she was at her wisest and most experienced as a parent. It all went just as Eugenia had planned, from Northeast to Northwest. Niels Erland, who liked to roam but had a frugal, organized side, at least the perfect quiet east, practical and obedient. Selma Ava, who was comfortable and kind. Sarah, a strong-willed, passionate girl. Sonia Venda, who was good with animals and a little bit prescient, far-seeing. 
Willem, capable and decisive, who also had an easy hand with the farm animals. And Nettie Vilfred, the only one with dark hair, though his eyes were as blue as his brothers and sisters. Nettie had been Eugenia's easiest birth yet, and he was a dear, quiet babe, smiling far more than he cried, which was seldom. Seven children in seven years. With a sigh of relief, Eugenia put away her supply of the herb feverfew, which eased morning sickness and the pains of childbirth, as well as her voluminous childbearing shift, which had seen her through the seven pregnancies. But then Elise, who at eight was our second eldest child, died suddenly. Elise had never been a strong child, but Eugenia had a special fondness for her, partly because she was an Eastbourne like herself. There is no pain deeper than that of a parent losing a child. But there were still six children who needed our care, and slowly time healed the sharpest of our grief. Yet, even as it did, the empty space at the east point of the compass began to gnaw at Eugenia. Nettie. Father told me that he first began to design wind roses when he was engaged to mother. As part of his apprenticeship, my grandfather gave him piles of maps to study, and he quickly noticed a symbol on almost every chart, usually in the bottom left corner. Father told me that the symbol was called a wind rose because it bore a resemblance to a flower with 32 petals, and it had long been used by the map makers to indicate the direction of the winds. Some were simple and some elaborate, but all used a spear point fleur de lis as the northern point of the rose. He also said that map makers would paint their wind roses in brilliant colors, not just because they were prettier that way, but also because they were easier to read in the dim lamplight of a ship's deck at twilight. I loved learning about the history of map making. I dreamed that when I grew up, I would go to one of the big cities and study with distinguished scholars on a wide range of subjects, including maps and exploration, or else I'd be a poet. I wrote one of my first poems about a wind rose. The spear points north, south, west, and east, wind always shifting a wandering beast, a beacon to sailors on the high seas, journeying afar on the wind's soft breeze. The best that could be said of it was that it was short. Father. One problem with my being a map maker is that I hated to travel. A born southeast, Eugenia would say. And I blamed myself when the map making business failed. In fact, it had already been on shaky ground. But when Esbjorn and his wife died in an influenza epidemic and the business fell to me, it soon became clear that I couldn't make a go of it. It didn't help that two of Esbjorn's biggest customers had also died in the epidemic. Eugenia had already worked her way through half of the compass points, so there were four children at home, but not enough food to go around. When a distant cousin of Eugenia's offered us a small plot of land to farm, we seized the opportunity and moved the family to a remote pocket of northern Njord. The cousin was generous, charging only a nominal rent, and all went well, for a time, until Elise died. Rose I can't remember when I first learned that I was born as a replacement for my dead sister, Elise. It was just one of the things I knew, the way I knew other things, like the story of the stormy circumstances of my own birth the unending catalogue of mother's superstitions, and my father's skill at drawing wind roses. Mother was always telling me about Elise, how good she was, how she always did as she was told, how she stayed close by, and what a great help she was to mother in the kitchen. I never could do any of that. It was partly that curious exploring side of me. I just had to see or taste or hold whatever it was that had caught my eye. But it was also some crazy restlessness, like my legs needed to be moving. I could never keep still, except once in a while when I was with Nettie. It was during one of the rare moments when I was being still with Nettie that I first discovered sewing. I was very young, maybe four years old. I was sitting on Nettie's lap and he was telling me a story about Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge. In the old tales, Bifrost connected our world with Asgard, the home of the gods. Mother was sitting across from us by the hearth, and she was mending. I'd heard the word mending before, but I didn't really know what it meant, except that it had something to do with making clothing last longer, 
and that it was something I'd be expected to do someday, something that even at age eight Elise had done very neatly and always sat still for. So whatever it was, mending had seemed a vaguely threatening thing, providing mother with yet another reason to scold me. But as I lay back in Nettie's lap, my eyes idly fell on some breeches of mine that mother was just beginning to work on. There was a great ugly tear in the backside that I had gotten sliding down a small waterfall earlier in the day. My near drowning at the bottom of the waterfall had left me more subdued and tired than usual. I closed my eyes sleepily, drawn into Nettie's description of Thor swinging his mighty hammer as he crossed the rainbow bridge. When I opened my eyes again, I saw that the rip in my breeches had disappeared. I sat up, wide awake. It was magic! It might be thought odd that I had never noticed Mother sewing up a hole before, but usually she saved her mending for later in the evening, the peaceful time of day when I was asleep. I was by her side in a flash, all trace of sleepiness gone, the Bifrost bridge forgotten. Do it again, I demanded. Do what? she asked, bewildered. Make a hole go away. She smiled and picked up another piece of mending. She showed me how she threaded the needle, then neatly stitched up a small tear in Sonia's smock. I watched avidly and then said with conviction, I want to. Mother hesitated a moment, weighing her natural concern about little fingers and sharp objects against the desire to encourage this unexpected interest in mending. Realizing it was a way to keep me sitting still, she agreed, and though a few drops of blood were spilled, I stubbornly kept at it, determined to master this magical talent. As I poked and prodded the fabric, I badgered Mother with questions about the needle, the pins, and where the thread came from, amazed to learn that it came from my own dear sheep, Bessie, and all her friends and relatives. From that evening, I was hooked, and I know both Nettie and Mother were pleased. Mending was one of the few things that kept me indoors, where they could keep an eye on me. Father You tell me about Elise, Rose would say to me. I suppose that was natural enough, though at the time I did worry that Eugenia spoke of Elise too much, setting her up as some sort of ideal that little Rose would never be able to measure up to. I needn't have worried. Rose was her own person from the beginning. She never showed any signs of changing her nature to please her mother or anybody else. She did ask me once to draw her a picture of Elise. Her request took me by surprise, but the more I thought about it, her curiosity was understandable. I confess I spent far too much time on the little drawing, but I think I... I think the work did me good, and Eugenia too. It brought back many good memories. When I showed the drawing to Rose, I couldn't tell what she thought at first. She just studied it very carefully for a long while. I had used my small supply of paints to enhance the drawing with color, and the only question Rose asked was about Elisa's hair. Is that the right color, father? I said yes, it was a close match, and Rose leaned down and laid a small lock of her own chestnut hair next to the yellow. Nettie and I are the only ones who don't have yellow hair, she said matter-of-factly. I nodded. Your mother's father had your color hair. That's where you and Nettie get it. The one who sailed on ships? Yes, she smiled. Then she asked me, as she often did, if she could see her wind rose, the one I had designed for her. And shortly after the birth of our first child, Niels Erland, I had drawn a wind rose, especially for him. And though I did not believe in the birth direction lore, I confess that I used images from it to design the wind rose. Niels Erland's design contained, among other things, a soaring white tern, a bird indigenous to our most northerly lands, and a ledger and quill for totting up accounts. I did the same for each child born. Rose in particular loved to pore over her drawing, tracing the lines with her fingers. I was always a trifle uneasy when she did afraid that her keen little eyes might see the lie there. It was so glaring to my own eyes, and it made me sad, for to me it marred the beauty of what was certainly the best of all the wind roses I had designed. A few times late at night, when the children were asleep, and there was no danger of being overheard, I brought it up to Eugenia, the lie. Do you not think it would be best for Rose to know the truth of her birth? She is young yet. It would be less... I paused, less harming to learn it now. I do not know what you are talking about, Arna. And truly, she didn't. She no longer saw the truth. 
she had erased it from her mind completely. And I wondered, then, if she wasn't a little touched, Branham Hoda, as they say in the old language. Indeed, the serene sureness with which she said that Rose was an Eastbourne made me doubt my own sanity. Maybe it had never occurred. But of course it had. It had been a month before Eugenia's lying in time, when she and I went out to Ascoy Forest to search for herbs. We tried to do this together every fortnight or so, a habit begun sometime after we moved to the farm. It was a way to spend a few quiet hours together, uninterrupted by a child's cries or questions. When the children were young, our neighbor Torst's wife had volunteered to watch them while we were gone. But now we could leave Niels Erland and Selma Eva, the eldest two, in charge. Eugenia's pregnancy had been uneventful, except for the extraordinary amount of movement from the baby. Eugenia swore to me that the baby had taken it upon herself to explore every last corner of her womb. One morning, after a particularly sleepless night for Eugenia, I told her, This child will be reaching for a nap before her mother's milk. I instantly regretted my words, because Eugenia pursed her lips and said, Eastbournes are not explorers. I had a little shiver of foreboding at her words. Eugenia was so set on this unborn child being an Eastbourne, so sure, it was like she was tempting fate. The day we went off herb hunting was cloudy. Eugenia was keen to find some burdock as well as more feverfew. She had just come across a lush stand of burdock and was leaning over to pick some when she staggered slightly. Oomph! Baby kicking again? I asked. Like he's trying to kick his way out, she complained, straightening slowly. She needs to learn some patience, I replied with a grin. Another four weeks to go, at least. The sky rumbled softly. Looking up, I said, Best we be heading back. Those clouds to the north look black. Eugenia nodded and moved toward her basket. But before she could reach it, she leaned way over, clutching her hands to her belly. Her protracted cry drowned out the rumblings of the sky. Eugenia lowered herself to the ground, her face twisted with pain. I was at her side in a moment, trying to keep my voice steady. We'll start back, soon as this pain passes. Eugenia shook her head. No, she whistled through her teeth. It's coming, fast. But I don't. You'll birth him, Arna, she said. I had helped with all the other births, and was not frightened of it. But a storm was about to break overhead, and I was worried. As I set about trying to make Eugenia more comfortable on the ground, I murmured a silent prayer. She was deep into birthing pains now, and her gusting screams echoed in the Oscoy forest. At one point, her eyes flicked open, and she looked around, panic taken. The sun! Where's the sun? She muttered. Oh. At one point, her eyes flicked open, and she looked around, panic taken. The sun! Where's the sun? She muttered then trailed into a drawn-out moan. It may have dimly registered on me that Eugenia was concerned about the birthing direction. But whatever I was thinking went straight out of my head when I realized that I was looking at the heel of a small foot. The baby was facing the wrong way. A hollow panic began to burn at the bottom of my belly. I closed my eyes and thought hard. What did the midwife do when the baby faced the wrong way? Some kind of herb, I guessed. I laid a hand on Eugenia's stomach and focused my thoughts into this newborn child. Turn yourself about, Baron, I whispered, willing the baby to listen, but nothing happened. Eugenia, I said softly into her ear, the baby is facing the wrong way. I'll need to go for help. No, Eugenia cried out. He's coming now. Her eyes roamed the bit of darkened sky she could see through the trees, looking for the sun. Where is it? What direction, Arna? I felt a great weight of confused emotion. It was incomprehensible to me that with both her life and the life of our child in the gravest of danger, she could think only of her cursed superstition. Then I thought to myself that perhaps she did not truly understand the peril she and the baby lay in. I can't do it myself, Eugenia, I said. We need the sun, was all Eugenia said, only the whites of her eyes showing. Suddenly, there was a great heave under my hands. Eugenia let out a scream and lifted her body, turning slightly to the right. Large raindrops began to pelt her upturned face. I stared in amazement at the top of my child's head. 
Somehow the bairn had turned itself. It was truly miraculous. I don't remember much about the next several minutes. Then, hush now, I shouted at Eugenia, and suddenly I was cupping a squalling baby in my two hands. It was small and red and wrinkled and had a mass of dark hair, a girl. Rain washed down the puckered face. Eugenia held her arms out to us, and I quickly folded our bairn into them. She murmured soft words of welcome over and over, and kissed the clenched eyes and fists. As she did so, a crack of light filtered in through the branches above, and Eugenia glanced upward, and suddenly her damp, flushed face turned a shade paler, and her smile vanished. I looked up to see what she had seen, and unexpectedly saw a rainbow with the watery sun behind. It was beautiful, I thought, and to me was a good omen. The rain still fell, lightly. North, she gasped in disbelief. Then I understood, and I almost laughed out loud in relief. She's a Northborn, then, is she? Oh, well, it must have been destined. No, she screamed at me. She is not a Northborn. She will not be a Northbairn. Eugenia, come. There is nothing wrong with a North child. High-spirited, perhaps. Besides, it's not but superstition. She is Ebba. I nodded, puzzled. "'Tis a nice name, Ebba. Then you will part with the practice of naming with the direction? I was facing east when the birthing began. I thought back. The sky had been dark. There was no way to tell what direction Eugenia had been facing. She is an east bairn, and her name is Ebba, Eugenia said defiantly. I nodded slowly, though I felt a stirring of unease. I will not have her die, she whispered. Die, I thought. Then I remembered the Studnasoka's prediction, death by ice and snow. And Arna, you will never tell a living soul. Tell what, Eugenia? That she is anything but an East Bairn. And she is an East Bairn. Her eyes burned wildly in her pale, wet face. I laid my hand on her tangled hair. You want time to think on it, Eugenia, I said. No, her voice was implacable. She is Ebba Rose, for the compass rose, because she is my last. Eugenia said firmly, her eyes intent on mine. Promise me, Arna, you will never tell another living soul. I hesitated. Finally, I said, I promise, because I could not bear the unhappiness behind those eyes. She smiled then and bent her face over the baby again, murmuring her love. Later, I took the baby from her, so Eugenia could rest a while before we began our walk back to the farmhold. I lightly ran my finger over the tips of the standing-up chestnut hair of my daughter. The hair was damp and cool, and as I looked into her wrinkled little face, a thought came, unbidden, unexpected. Neom, born of the rainbow. Had I heard it in a poem long ago? One of Nettie's poems? Whatever the case, from then on, though I honored my agreement to Eugenia, in my heart I called my daughter Neom. When I wrote in the family birth book of the beginning day of my eighth child, I wrote Eva Rose, and when I drew the wind rose, as I had for each of my eight children, hers was the most intricate and would easily have been the most beautiful had it not been for the lie. A strange thing came over me, however, as I drew, and almost without meaning to, the drawing I did also told the truth, but it was only there for one who wanted to see it. It was a secret, and so it remained until that catastrophic night when the white bear came to our door. All right, if you like that book, you can place a request to check it out from the library. I hope you enjoyed the story. Have a great weekend. See you next time. Bye.